Uh, how are you feeling, Boalu? Very nice to meet you. Yeah, very nice to meet you. So, you used to be the vice president of Citibank, uh, one of the biggest banks in the world. Uh, and today you're a vegan and working for animals. How was, uh, how was it to make that transition for you? Well, many years ago, um, in, in my 30s, as part of my job in the mergers acquisitions business, I went out to visit a client. And the client owned a number of different kinds of companies in a number of industries. And I went out to have a look at all of them. And one of the companies that he owns turned out to be a slaughterhouse. And what I saw that day absolutely terrified me. Totally disgusted me, in fact. I was appalled and horrified. And I came away from that experience and I became a vegetarian immediately. But I didn't know enough to be enlightened. I still consumed dairy. And then I was on a business trip to India. And one day I was on the street and I saw a dairy man pulling his injured cow to the slaughterhouse. The cow had been hit by a lorry and had damaged her spine. She was in agony and could barely walk. To get her to move, he was throwing chili powder into her eyes and sticking sharp objects up her anus. And beside her walked her starving, skinny little calf. Now, when he got to the slaughterhouse gates, before he handed her over to the slaughterman, to the butcher, the bastard milked her. Now, if that doesn't change the heart of a man, nothing will. So when I returned home, I studied the dairy industry and I discovered that dairies are gulags of despair. Milk is meat in liquid form. It is a cruel, disgusting atrocity. So I stopped consuming dairy products. But I had never really heard the word vegan. So I never really ever became vegan. I just woke up one day and discovered that is what I was. My shoes had no leather in them, nor my belt. Even my watch band had no leather products in them. So I became a, a vegan by default before I'd really met any vegans. But now, of course, um, I meet them all the time because this movement is growing very rapidly. And I'm very pleased to be a very small part of it. And the people you work with and your family, your friends, how did they react when you made this transition? It was a, a, a mixed reception. Um, it went from outright hostility. Some people thought I had become eccentric. Uh, some people thought I was going through a, a premature midlife crisis. Um, some people understood, so they fell into many categories. Um, I didn't tell anyone for a long time. They just noticed that I behaved differently. And why didn't you tell them? Because I didn't realize I, I had become a vegan or a vegetarian. I just didn't want to be a part of the industry or to contribute in any possible way, even uh, in very subtle ways, towards that, that atrocity. And I was still finding my way. But once I started to understand it, then I became slightly more outspoken. And as a consequence, I, I confess, I became somewhat um, uh, unpopular because I was discussing a fairly confronting issue. And I knew then uh, that my days uh, in the corporate world were numbered. There was no place for me there. Uh, and why is that? Did I clash these uh, values? Uh, in these different cultures? Yes, ultimately it does, because working in large organizations and dealing with corporations which are largely um, dominated by people who consume um, dairy and um, animal products generally, um, makes it uncomfortable, because it doesn't matter how well you try to conceal the fact that you are vegan, it, it becomes apparent. And I didn't want to simply be a vegan. I discovered that I had something else stirring in, in my heart, I think. 
I wanted to become an activist. And since then I've changed my mind. Uh, I don't even want to be an activist. Uh, I really want to be a pro-activist. What do you mean by that, a pro-activist? I want to anticipate changes that are coming down the pike and respond appropriately, mm -hmm. to go on the front foot, to confront industry, governments, and uh, the entrenched paradigm that treats other living beings as commodities. Each animal is not simply a matter of biology. Each of them has their own biography. Hmm. And I'm not going to be the one who snuffs out their life simply for my taste buds. Hmm. So I'm, I, I, I'm not going to sit on the fence any longer. And sitting on the fence is for cowards and crows. Hmm. And I don't want to be either for the moment. Okay. And how long is it now you have become a vegan, even, even if you didn't... Um uh, say that about yourself. Well, I can't give you an exact date because it was such a subtle, gradual mm -hmm. metamorphosis. Oh, okay. But uh, I would say I'm certainly vegetarian for about 25, more than 25 years, mm -hmm. and vegan for quite a good part of that time. Mm -hmm. And if you compare the reactions you got then uh, when you came out as a vegan, vegetarian, to now, when you mention the word vegan, how has it changed uh, the, the perception of uh, this idea of veganism? That's a good question. In the early stages, it was treated with either derision or ridicule or outright hostility. But I think over time, the paradigm has changed slightly. There are some people who still refuse to accept the reasons I put forward for getting off the meat and dairy drug. And if they refuse point blank to discuss it intelligently or rationally, I leave them alone completely. So I, I, there are more important issues to, to deal with. There are other people who are willing to listen. Mm. But there are other people who are actively listening and responding. And these people are usually very intelligent. They want to learn something from a conversation. And they're very fertile ground for getting them to understand the vegan message. And I think I've been very fortunate in that I've spoken to some audiences, small ones, of 200 people and sometimes 5,000. And many of them have, are intelligent, hardworking, ambitious, and you don't have those qualities unless you're also curious. Mm. And because they are curious, they're happy to learn more. And the more they learn, the more they come over to the vegan side. Because the meat and dairy industry, let's be honest and not pull any punches, it's a sunset industry. It has no place in civilized society, period. And you think it will shut down? It has no choice. There are some things that just can't be hidden for, forever. You can't, uh, you can't hide the sun, you can't hide the moon, and you can't hide the truth and the truth will come out. These gulags have got to be shut down once and for all. Mm. So, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing these days now when you're not in the bank business? Right. What do you spend your time on? Right. Basically, I decided to take whatever resources I had available, time, assets, money, energy, information, and basically give away what I had uh, with warm hands and die broke. And so far we're right on budget. Um, so today I support a number, maybe about 500 projects, and we're in about 40 countries. Um, but um, I'm now spending more time and energy um, giving lectures or attending uh, events with our other activists, not just animal rights activists, but human rights activists, environmentalists, people who take the long view of life, that um, we are here not simply to have um, fun time and make money. There's a deeper, more important objective at play. Um, I'm reminded of the words of uh, um, of Judge White, the closing words and the bonfire of the vanities.
when he talks about the law. And he said, the law is humanity's attempt at decency. And that's basically the cause I'm pursuing. I'm not trying to do anything major. I'm just trying to, in my own small way, to be as decent as I possibly can and to show others that the consumption and the killing and the exploitation of non-human animals is a crime of unimaginable proportions. When you look at the simple facts, Martin, in human history, only 100 billion human beings have ever lived. Seven and a half billion people are alive today. And we human beings torture and kill two billion sentient, living, loving animals every week. We stab and suffocate one billion ocean animals every eight hours. If we were killed at the same rate, we would be wiped out in one weekend. 10,000 entire species are wiped out every year because of the actions of one species. And we now face the sixth mass extension in cosmological history. Now, if any other organism did this, a biologist would call it a virus. It really is a crime of unimaginable proportions. And I'll have no part in it. Uh, I think uh, many who are, who are interested in animal rights uh, know, perhaps know your face and your voice, um, especially from a speech you held in Australia in 2012, uh, a debate actually uh, on the topic of animals should be off the menu. And I think that has been seen by hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of yes. people. Uh, and there you talk about the suffering of animals, but also about famine, agriculture the, and the environment. And I think what moved me the most uh, about the speech was when you talked in the beginning about your uh, father and uh, his cancer mm. yeah. and how that opened up your eyes for the suffering of animals. Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, uh, interestingly enough, that was the first debate I'd ever been in. Um, when they asked me to go in it, I didn't know any better and I just said yes. So it was Peter Singer and myself and another person uh, against basically people from the meat and dairy industry in the lobby. Um, it was unfair really, I must confess. Uh, each side had three people, but we really had four. We also had the truth. So um, the, the episode you refer to is uh, about my dad. Um, that is true. Um, I heard the screams of my dying father as his body was ravaged by the many cancers that killed him. And I realized I'd heard those screams before in the slaughterhouse, on the cattle ships to the Middle East, and a dying mother whale as a harpoon explodes in her brain as she calls out to her calf. Their cries were the cries of my father. They were identical. And I discovered that when we suffer, we suffer as equals. And in their capacity to suffer, a dog is a pig, is a bear, is a boy. And that is where I stand. At least now, I know for a fact which trench I'm willing to die in. I know where I stand. Another thing you said in another talk was that um, before you spent money on making the slaughterhouses more humane. Uh, but that's something you regret today, it's something you uh, see as a mistake. Uh, can you tell us why? Yes, because I do think that there is no such thing as humane slaughter. You cannot kill another living being humanely if that other living being doesn't want to die. So anyone who tells you that there is such a thing as humane slaughter is a liar or a fool or a profiteer. You don't have to take them seriously. They're talking nonsense. So I had indeed tried to improve the system and I thought that that might help. Um, I'm 
thinking particularly about the Basidine slaughterhouse in Cairo in Egypt to try and improve the standards there where our animals under the livestock um, export program, the live animal export program, uh, to see our animals have their eyes stabbed out and their tendons slashed. I thought there was a way to at least alleviate that particular pressure point. But it was an abject failure. I can tell anyone who tells you otherwise is blind. Every penny invested, every initiative that we tried to bring to bear was wasted. And it's wasted for one reason. The industry is inherently cruel. You can't avoid it. It's not that these people are doing it deliberately for any particular pleasure. It's just that the job requires it to be done. So um, I, don't, I no longer believe in animal welfare. I do not. I believe in animal rights. But some say that uh, by doing reforms like um, banning uh, cage uh, eggs, uh, for instance, uh, can be a step towards uh, uh, the freeing of the animals. Mm -hmm. Do you see some value in that kind of reform work? Look, it's such a big piece of cake. I don't mind how the cake is cut. I've got this plenty of low-hanging fruit for me to take. I'm quite happy for people to, to suggest that uh, improving conditions um, in, in the industry is a way to go as long as you understand right up front, I don't want to mislead anybody, the end game is for you to shut down the industry where there will be no cages. There won't be any cages because there'll be no need to kill the animals or to exploit the animals. As long as I can say that openly, clearly, politely and firmly so you understand my agenda, we're going to get along fine. So go ahead and build a bigger cage but you must understand the following day I'll be coming around to see you and saying I don't even like the bigger cage, I want to tear it down. Um, so uh, later today you will receive uh, the Peter Singer Award yes. uh, for your work for animals. Uh, can you tell us a bit what it means to you to receive this? Uh, well indeed, um, I remember in reading a book um, I don't know how many, 15, 15, 20 years ago. And it was published in 1975. But I also remember another book. I think it was published in 1962. It was by Solzhenitsyn. Uh, it was called One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. And it made no impact at all. Um, Solzhenitsyn's work, people read it, but it didn't make any impact at all. But 20 odd years later, it changed the way people saw Russia. And most importantly, it changed the way Russians saw themselves. And I'll be saying so, because that book, Solzhenitsyn's fingerprints, are on every concrete block that, that existed when the Berlin Wall came down. Now, with, with Peter's book, that was published in 75. That made very little impact at all. It was how it was. Animal liberation, right? Yes, it was uh, correct. It, uh, it, it sank without really much visible impact. But 20 years later, there's a new generation of activists who cut their teeth on it, who understood it. They were, they were brought into the movement by reading it. And uh, I think uh, we will owe Peter a debt of gratitude that we will never be able to repay. He opened the doors. And there have been others since then who've done a wonderful job, and I, I give them credit too. Uh, we must always give credit where it is due. Even when sometimes we disagree on the margins, when we see something done that advances the cause of animal rights, we should recognize it as graciously as possible. Um, in my experience, people in general uh, have empathy for animals. Uh, we don't generally want to contribute to um, pain to animals. Uh, and yet, so many are still eating meat and other uh, animal products. 
and they are just doing that. They are being a part of the problem rather than part of the solution. Have you thought about this? Why is that uh, this contradiction in what we believe in our hearts and what we do? Well, I think there's a, a, a great disconnect. Um, most of the people, including myself, as I say, the, there was a time when my f favorite food was filet mignon and lobster, a fact for which I'm so profoundly ashamed today. But when we were brought up as kids, our mums and dads fed us meat and dairy and were told almost from birth that this is good for you and it's acceptable and it's a moral you know, way of behaving. Um, religion has told us we have dominion over the animals and they're there for our purposes. Now, of course, this kind of um, nonsense doesn't stand up to any scrutiny at all. But when you're a two or a three-year-old child, you don't know any better. And of course, um, once you start eating meat and dairy, it's become, it becomes addictive. It becomes comfort food. When you, we eat it, we're subconsciously reminded of the days when we were taken care of by mum and dad. And it makes us feel good and loved and all those things. So I don't see, it, I don't see meat as a, as a food as such. Um, I think it's a, it's a drug and we are addicted to it. And when you're addicted to it, to any product, whether it's meat or dairy or crack cocaine or, or, or tobacco, when you're addicted to it, you will come up with the most outrageous, ridiculous arguments to defend it. Uh, was it Goethe who said that mankind is motivated not by reason but by ritual? We go through this nonsense ritual of believing that what we're doing is ethical and that we are humane. We are many things, but in our treatment of animals, we are not. Uh, in one speech you mentioned uh, that the most beautiful word you know uh, is ahimsa. Oh yes. Uh, play, please say more about that word and what it means to you. You have it on your shirt in the back, I think. Oh yes, I do. do I? Yes, I think that's true. Um, ahimsa is, in my judgment, the most beautiful word ever written at any time in any country in human history. It came from India from the Upanishads about 3,000 years ago. And it means non-violence to any living being. Now, I think it's beautiful, not because it describes our politics, our diet, our lifestyle, or our whims, but because it describes our character. It says we reject violence wherever and whenever it occurs. And that violence is not just in the slaughterhouse, but on the streets with road rage, on the ways in which we talk to each other, or the ways in which we interrelate with our colleagues at work or our neighbors. And most importantly, nonviolence at our dining tables. And that is the biggest negative vector force on the planet. The meat and, in the meat and dairy industry, in my judgment, is the greatest scam ever inflicted on humanity and the animal kingdom. And there, as I say, it, it has no place in civilized society. You have uh, said already many years ago that animal rights is the greatest social justice issue since the abolition of slavery. I have. Yeah. And what do you think today when you see the, the global animal rights movement and how do you see its future? I would like to see a day, I'm thinking long term, hopefully not too long, when it wouldn't even matter, we wouldn't even talk about animal rights because it would be as natural as breathing. So I, I think it, it is the greatest social justice issue purely on, not just purely, but to a large extent, by virtue of the sheer volume and numbers and the weight of cruelty and damage that animal cruelty does, not just to the animals, but to, to all the stakeholders, all the people alive today, particularly the ones, the poorest, the most marginalized, and future generations. 
Um, by 2048, all our fisheries are going to be dead. They're, going, they're being poisoned by the animal industrial complex. If it continues like it does today. Correct, exactly. Yeah. And there seems to be no sign that the curve, we've hit the top of our curve. You know, the, the growth rates continue. And unfortunately, um, governments and industry really don't care if the car goes into a ditch, as long as they get to drive. And this kind of short-termism, this strong desire to consider short-term profits, regardless of the, the long-term costs, that could be the undoing of the civilization. And there are many people who argue, and so do I, that unless something radical is done, and soon, this will be our final century. And much better minds than I have expressed that sentiment and have done so much more eloquently and elegantly. But that reality is true. I know you travel a lot uh, in the world and uh, meet many activists, especially for animal rights. But how do you see the power of the movement now? And, and uh, do you think we can have this uh, great change that we aspire? It depends on which day of the week you ask me. Some days I'm optimistic and some days I'm not. Uh, but today I'm feeling optimistic. And I say that if, uh, if I wasn't optimistic, or maybe not optimistic, I'm hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful that we have in our hearts the capacity for compassion and the, compa and the capacity to change. Because without those two qualities, what are we? We're just a, a greedy um, biped with an opposable thumb, trying to make money, consume as much as possible, with no thought for tomorrow. But that's not a very edifying picture of this so-called homo sapien, you know, the, the thinking ape. That's not thinking, that's being blind. And there's no room for that kind of notion in our vocabulary or in our future. Yeah. Thank you so much, Philip Wallen. It's been yeah. a great pleasure.